Good morning, Benjamin Hadfield. Teach me to dive, technical dive instructor here in Idaho. Yes, there is diving in Idaho. It's amazing. Um, there is actually really cool diving. You have to get deep to get to it. So we're gonna jump into the big realm of my favorite kind of diving, tech diving, with none other than Paul, who was one of my instructors for this. So I'm super excited to have Paul with us. Paul, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Ben. Perfect. Well, Paul, let's just jump in the deep end of the pool. And can you tell me about what was your diving journey? How did you get to be the superstar Paul that you are today? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I started my <laughs> dive career in, in college and I took a scuba diving class in college really for the sole purpose of annoying my parents because they told me no. <laughs> so that was my first uh, now we open water class back in the, those days. This was 1976, 1977. Um, so that, that's how I started out. And it kind of, uh, kind of took off from there. As my wife refers to it today, it's my hobby run amok. <laughs> my, <laughs> that's, I think, uh, um, a lot of us, especially instructors. I think a lot of us became instructors so we could afford to, to keep that, uh, that hobby going and running amok. <laughs> Now, do you need a license to run a muck, or is that just a general uh, certification? <laughs> I, I seem to do it um, in most aspects of my life. <laughs> right on. Well, perfect. So you're you were in, you became now. How did you work through the process of becoming an instructor? What what made that happen? Well, I was mostly by accident. I did a now instructor program like a hundred years ago, uh, but really didn't do much uh, teaching with it. Um, didn't really want to, uh, and then it was. Really, when I came into the SDI TDI family a dozen years ago now, that my, my teaching really, really took off. Um, and, and that was because I found myself in a great environment surrounded by some great people that made me want to teach. Um, was originally going up in New York and New Jersey, eh, I really had no desire to do a lot of teaching up there. Um, <laughs> down here in Florida uh, and surrounded by the SDI TDI family, it, uh, it was a whole different world for me. Right on. Maybe you could discuss, uh, so you took NAWI back in the, the mid-70s. Yeah. What, what was the difference? I mean, you teach open water now. What's the difference between the courses that you took in the 70s and what you teach today? I think if, if we taught today the way I was taught back in uh, 1976, 77 and such, uh, the students would quit and walk out and, and probably sue us all. Um, you know, it, it, the, the physicality of it, the toughness of it, the, the almost literal beatings, <laughs> um, it was just a different world of teaching. And when you get down to it, most of the instructors that, that I ran into back in those days, um, they were military, they were Vietnam, they were Korea, uh, they were, um, and, and they were teaching from that mindset. Uh, it was, it was a much um, I don't want to say tougher, but it was tougher. <laughs> yep, I remember that. I remember my first uh, uh, Nowy course, oddly enough, as well. So I know exactly what you're take, talking about. I think there's a, a in the automotive industry, they have a great phrase, and I think it applies here too. That yesterday's policies are today's felonies. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, right on. Well, who are you currently teaching with? Well, I'm working with Stuart Scuba here in Stuart, Florida. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to the world of Stuart Scuba. When I, when I got down here, uh, I was looking around to do some tech diving and, and 15 years ago, whatever, uh, well, a dozen years ago in the Stuart case, there just really weren't any, a lot of tech diving going on. I mean, there were a lot of shops that claimed to be tech diving and technically oriented. And I, I quickly found out they, they really had no idea what they were doing. Uh, they, they were not truly tech diving groups. And then uh, because SDI moved down here from Maine, uh, going back a few years, uh, and they came to Stewart, Florida, and their local shop was Stewart Scuba. And that's how I found my way into Stewart Scuba. And I quickly realized that Stewart Scuba had a lot of technical expertise and actually knew what they were doing in the world of tech diving. So that's how I knew I found a home at Stewart Scuba. Um, now, in the ensuing years, we have a lot more shops and operations that that have some focus of technical diving. Um, so it's not uh, the desert that it was years ago. Uh, so it, they're, they're, it's more, it's a little more common now, but uh, I don't know, that's how I knew where I, where I belonged. <laughs> right on. Now, who was your first tech instructor? 
Well, uh, back in the earlier days when I started this, there really weren't a lot of classes. You just kind of did things and learned by doing, unfortunately. Um, you know, there wasn't a such, you know, TDI didn't exist back in those days. So, you know, deep rec penetration, a lot of folks were, were just doing it. You learn by diving with people who had been doing it and they weren't necessarily instructors or even, you know, have those kinds of certifications. That was my first taste of it. Um, and then a larger group of folks at, at TDI headquarters, um, took me further, took me to the next step. So there was a, a long list of people from uh, Brian Carney on down who introduced me to the rest of technical diving. And then I, I also, fortunately, I have um, one of my lifelong friends and I've known him literally since kindergarten uh, is Joel Silverstein, who is a guru in the world of tech nut diving and probably has given us uh, most or a good portion of what we do today. He's one of the true pioneers um, and uh, I guess I've known Joel now for upwards of 60 years, much to our, our mutual wow. dismay. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. Right on. So <coughs> coming up to the, uh, the SDI TDI and TDI became what it is today, which is a phenomenal agency when it comes to tech. Um, how do you feel that uh, Brett was an influencer on your personal training as well as with TDI? Well, Brett was always like, you know, off in the shadows in the days, uh, his influence, his, his direction, his guidance, uh, was so invaluable to so many. And, uh, I've had the, the opportunity of meeting Brett a number of times, and he was one of the funniest human beings I have ever met. His sense of humor and his passion for diving was just always an incredible, all encompassing force when you were uh, around him uh, and, and just sitting around after a, 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 having drinks at a DEMA conference, for example, you know, Brett's pontification on a numerous topics, many of which had nothing to do with diving, was always <laughs> um, a, a entertaining and informative. Fair enough. Uh, certainly the, the diving world lost a, a giant. Um, absolutely. So well, uh, what certifications do you currently hold? Oh, gee, there's a, a long list. I, I guess in the SDI family, I have, uh, oh, gee, just about every specialty instructor that uh, SDI has, um, except altitude diving. We don't have much of that here in Florida. <laughs> really? I, I'm, I'm very surprised with their highest mountain being 400 feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we don't have much of that. Um and uh, needless to say, although I, I have an ice diving uh, certification, we don't do much of that here either. Uh, and I, so you know, that's understandable. The only ice is in our cocktails after diving. <laughs> um, and then in the TDI world, uh, instructor for uh, intro to tech and advanced nitrox and uh, decompression procedures, advanced rec, a uh, bunch of other things, also a rebreather diver. Um, been diving the AP diving inspiration rebreather now for several years. Um, awesome machine, by the way. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, there's a wide, pretty wide range. Right on. So what do you think the, as we start getting into this, um, you teach a lot of tech, you taught my, uh, my wife and I tech as well, and we're, we're all the better for it as well. So what do you think some of the key quality and characteristics you look for in an aspiring tech diver? Well, you know, the, the one thing, and I, I've turned people away from technical training um, because I, I didn't feel they were ready for it mentally. And that is really the number one thing. I meet people who want to break into tech. And the first thing I always try to find out is why. And I, I've literally had people say, because I want to be able to tell my friends I did a 200 foot dive, a 300 foot dive. I'm like, yeah, that's not a good reason. Um, and, and that's the, the kind of like the people ask me, what is the, the number one critical skill? And the critical skill is the one up here. It's being able to think, being able to process, being able to um, understand, being able to focus. Um, that is the number one thing for, for tech diving. It's, you know, other skills, B, 
build on that. It's the, the mental toughness for tech diving. It's the mental awareness of tech diving. It's the understanding of yourself that goes a long way. I had one student and, and in some ways he was one of my best tech students that never got certified. Um, and this is a guy, very experienced diver, very, very solid skills, um, been diving for a good number of years. So we're doing his advanced nitrox deco procedures class. We have him all kitted out. He's got his deco cylinder on. He's got his doubles on his back. We hit the water. We drop to the bottom and his skills are a complete and total mess. And it wasn't happening. We ended the dive. We came up and he just looked at me on the boat and said, you know what? This is not for me. I'm not doing this. That was the number one lesson he learned that he didn't want to, he thought he wanted to do this and he had the right mindset for doing it until he decided he didn't want to do it. And to me, that was a fantastic learning experience um, for him because that, that answered a lot of questions for him. And I said, and, and he was worried I was going to push him. I'm like, no, you, you just did something invaluable. You learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's like we, we've we always talked about. It. Anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence. Exactly. And I've, and I've always been more proud of the divers that um, were able to step back and say, I'm not ready now or I, I need to reset. Um, I've had a tremendous amount of respect for those. And uh, that uh, instead of the ones that get out and they, they said, I was nervous at going in and I, and I know as a shit show throughout the process, but, and I'm like, well, why didn't you stop and reset, get your mind right. And they're like, well, you know, I didn't want to disappoint you. And I'm like, man, you're disappointing me. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And I've had, you know, I've had um, a number of other students who, you know, we look at the standards and we say, okay, the standards say that there's five dives or six dives or, you know, eight dives, depending on you know what classes you're doing and how they're, they're set up. And, um, you know, I've had an, a, a number of students who on the, the first couple of dives, things didn't work the way we needed them to work. So we, we and one of the things I always tell students from the get-go is don't focus on the number of dives in the standards. Focus on mastery and the goal of perfection. We're never going to be perfect, but our goal is going to be perfection. And we, we want to get close to that. So I've had divers who literally get through the tech training in 15 dives. I had one guy um, for a variety of reasons. It took him close to 20 dives to get there. Uh, and we were fine tuning things and learning every step of the way. Um, you know, this was actually a guy who was also an adaptive diver. So we also had to kind of customize his scuba gear, his, his tech gear to fit his uh, disability, which was a cool learning experience for me. Um, and he's turned into a, a phenomenal diver and someone that you know, I, I go diving with today. Uh, so it's always an interesting adventure. Now, your adaptive diver, is that the gentleman from UPS with the one arm? Yes. Yes, that is uh, the fellow with oh, right the arm. one arm. We, we met him. I, yes. I was uh, very impressed. Very, very, very nice guy. In fact, we took our uh, some of our classes with him. So fantastic. So, Paul, tech diving can be kind of challenging. What advice do you have for candidates to effectively prepare for the course so they can increase their successful chances? Well, you know, that, that's a, a, another great start. And, and, you know, getting into your own head and understanding yourself, understanding where your skills are before you start tech training. Um, you know, I've had a, a number of students who, okay, before you're going to get through the rest of this class, you've got to go back and work on basic buoyancy. You've got to do an advanced buoyancy class. Um, is, that is something that, you know, needs to be close to perfect. Um, and, I, and I see that a lot, people overestimating their basic open water skills. You know, how comfortable are you taking your mask off and putting it back on underwater? Uh, you don't want to be nervous or scared doing that uh, when you're um, embarking on a tech class. So having those basic skills be perfect, something that, you know, a lot of us take for granted as instructors, especially are, are a lot of those basic skills, because, you know, I, I know you don't even think twice about doing a mask flood and clear or a mask remove and replace. I mean, you know, you and I, we do those hundreds of times teaching open water classes. Um, but so many people, you know, they do it in an open water class. They never do it again. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, regulator recovery, that kind of thing, which is super important in tech diving because you're, you know, when you're switching gas, you're, you're doing a regulator recovery or, or inflating your surface marker from, from depth. And instead of, you know, doing it from 20 feet, you know, you're doing it at 70 feet. Uh, you know, how comfortable are you doing those things while maintaining perfect buoyancy? You know, it's one thing in an open water class, if you're going to send your marker up from 30 or 40 feet, and you, yeah, you go up five or 10 feet when you're doing that. Okay, you know, that's an open water class. It's like eh, kind of okay, sort of. In a tech class, it's not really okay doing that. So having that focus on those basic skills is a huge part of it. Because, you know, the, the, the real tech stuff, the physics, the physiology, um, the specific tech skills, those are kind of easy to teach and easy to learn if your basic skill set is there. Absolutely. And a lot of those uh, skills uh, and dive planning, there's computer programs for that. We sit down with that and, and the math to figure out uh, gas consumption or uh, gas availability is pretty basic it you can do it on your iphone in about a minute and a half for your entire gas compilation oh, so, sure. you, I agree with you. so in the way i way i like to put it to the students is uh twin sets or side mount don't create new problems they reveal problems that you already have that you yeah. just hadn't finished up working on in in your open water class so. exactly one of the funny <laughs> things I, i've done with some tech students um is i've taken them with their well teched up with uh their doubles on their back and a deco cylinder on their side. And I bring them to the world famous Blue Heron Bridge, which is all of 20 feet deep at its deepest point. And we're going to practice buoyancy in eight feet of water. And let me tell you, that is a great place. If you can master buoyancy like that in eight feet of water, and you, it's pretty, pretty good. And it's really funny watching people try to do that. Uh, one one of my uh, buddies once took a picture of me. I was testing out my a dry suit. So there I am at Blue Heron Bridge in less than 10 feet of water. And I am perfectly trimmed out and teched out with my dry suit, with deco cylinders, with doubles. And I look so badass, but I'm in like eight feet of water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that had to be a, a very pungent dive in a dry suit at Blue Heron Bridge. Oh, my heck. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Well, it was winter, so it was, you know, or, or what we call winter here in South Florida. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure the water was down to, what, a, 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 a brisk 78, 79 degrees? Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine diving a, a dry suit at that at that warm. Everything for me I, is 60 degrees, 50 degrees, 40. We got down to depth um, on our deep class uh, last week, and it was uh, uh, 41 at, at uh, 120 feet. Well, so. We get we get surprising colder days too. We'll get uh, fifty two degree water on some of our deep sites. We have uh, one of my favorite uh, somewhat technical wrecks is um, I'm sorry about the dog there. Someone's walking around the house. Um, one of our technical wrecks is one hundred and thirty five hundred and forty feet. Uh, the the Rankin out of Stewart. Come here, girl. Yes, I know. She stops barking at the uh, lawn care guy. <laughs> okay, no, he's not here for you, Foo Foo. Come here. Um, so one, it's a 135, 140 feet, the USS Rankin out of Stewart. Phenomenal dive. I don't think you've had a chance to get on that when you've been here. I haven't done the Rankin. I've been wanting to. It is an awesome uh, dive, but it gets these weird cold currents. So sometime like in the... You know, the summer when it's, you know, 85 plus in other dive locations, we've had 52 degree water at 135 feet on the rank. It makes for a very short dive if you're wearing a three mil. Absolutely. So you're saying when I come out in January, we're diving the Rankin and I should bring my dry suit too. <laughs> <laughs> would not, uh, would not be uh, inappropriate. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, we'll plan on that. I'm coming out in January and, and we'll plan on hitting the Rankin together. I'm Go looking cool. forward to that. Yeah, let me know. Let me know when you're getting out here. I'm doing a Cozumel trip first week in uh, January, from the sixth to the tenth. Absolutely, I should be out there for the whole month of January. Oh, so, cool. uh, awesome. Yeah, should be. Diving. Yeah, we're going to definitely do some diving. So, Paul, to kind of get back on topic. What are some of the essential skills and techniques that students should really focus on first mastering before they even think about coming into a tech course? Well, like I said, those basic open water skills, you know, that that kind of basic stuff that 
mass flood and clear, the regulator recovery, buoyancy, everything that you know you didn't feel happy doing in your open water class is stuff you should really be able to master. Uh, you know, being very cognizant of watching your computer, watching your uh, pressure gauge, uh, you know, that basic dive planning skill set. And, you know, we take those basic skills and we, we elevate them once you get into the, the world of technical diving uh, uh, to make them that much better. <laughs> um, but without that basic foundation, you're it, just not ready. And and I, I see this occasionally. We'll get students who, you know, they, we've done their open water class. A couple of months later, we do their advanced open water class. And then a couple of months later, they come, I, I want to be a technical diver. No, you're not ready for it. You've only got, you know, 15 dives. Um, <laughs> and, and it happens more often than, than I think. Um, but, um, you know, it's those kinds of things where focusing on that basic stuff, that foundational stuff is so important. Right on. So technical diving is definitely challenging. So as a, a tech instructor, <clears throat> um, what do you do to create and help with a safe, enjoyable environment um, to make sure that your divers are safe, but they approach the, their life with safety as well and foster that positive experience all at the same time? Well, <laughs> one of the first things I tell students when they show up for their, their first classroom session uh, for, for tech diving is I tell them that there's a couple of differences that we have in technical diving that makes it different than you know, open water dive. And that is one, it is more mission oriented. You know, when we do open water dives, it's okay, we're going to kick you off the boat. We're going to drop you in X feet of water. Uh, you're going to follow the reef. You're going to look at some pretty fish, watch your pressure gauge, make sure you come up to the boat with not less than 500 PSI, go have fun. And that's pretty much the philosophy of, of most open water divers. Technical diving, it's far more mission oriented. It's we have set points of what we're doing uh, and when we're doing things. So this is our this is how much gas we're going to turn around and end the dive. This is when we're going to come up at this time or gas pressures. And, and we, we have to understand that that's, you know, it's more mission oriented. Uh, tech diving, most of it is, you know, we're focusing on uh, hitting a wreck and seeing a specific wreck and following a specific profile on that wreck or one of our deeper tech dive sites uh, of, of this is how we're going to navigate it. This is where we're going to go. Uh, we're going to check our pressures at these points. Uh, we're always going to stay in communication and just getting that mindset in place. And then I remind um, prospective students that Unlike open water diving, technical diving, there's a very easy ways to kill yourself in technical diving. Uh, and we're going to do a, spend a lot of time of mitigating those risks and understanding what those risks are. Um, and that goes a long way in getting students ready. They have to understand that this is a must, much more uh, inherent, this environment has much more inherent risk to it than just uh, doing an open water dive and looking at pretty fish on a 60 foot reef. Um, so that's part of getting that mindset in control. And then, you know, it's the, the, the skills that, you know, we go with, with monitoring that stuff with buddy awareness, which is a big way. I mean, we, we see that all the time in, in open water diving. Yeah, you get separated from your buddy, you know, you're following the reef, you're following the group, you know, uh, okay. But in tech diving, it's much more important to stay focused on your buddy, stay with your buddy. Um, you know, keep that arm's distance from your buddy when you can um, and following, you know, good buddy control procedures. Uh, so there's a lot of more moving parts when we get into the world of tech diving. I think it's one of the things that I, I worry about with the tech divers I create. I, I teach them that exact keep within arm's distance. But there's also a visibility issue that they get into where they can't see their buddy. And I, I worry about sending them out to Florida where all of a sudden they have a hundred feet of biz and, and they're like, Oh, I can see my buddy. I'm like, no, no, the rules are, the rules are the same. Right. Rules <laughs> Just, don't change. <laughs> so that's, I, I worry about that. I try and make sure we talk about that as well. So you teach a lot in twin sets. I don't, I don't believe you teach side mat at all. If I remember correctly. That is uh, um, correct. Uh, so what's the biggest secret to mastering the twins? I mean, they're not light by any shadow. No. And, you know, that's 
that's another thing I see frequently with, with people as well. And it is, so I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm six foot three. I'm a uh, very athletic. So me throwing a pair of uh, high pressure steel 100s on my back, I, I, it's not a big deal for me to do that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's not easy for a lot of people. Um, but you know, part of that is you know, dealing with the, the, the right kinds of gear configuration. I mean, I've had smaller stature divers, you know, they don't need high pressure steel 100s. They need high pressure steel 80s. That takes a lot of weight off. Um, I know um, I had one student and she was a petite woman. She was diving a pair of steel um, 72s, um, mm-hmm. which was interesting. She still had way better air consumption than I did. Um, but mm-hmm. Small, younger woman, what do you, you know, what, can, what do you expect? Um, so, you know, finding that right gear configuration for people um, is, is a big part of managing that. Um, you know, you mentioned side mount and, you know, I've had a number of people who, who uh, go tech with side mount. I, I don't teach side mount because I've never, I, I've never personally been comfortable doing that off boats in the ocean. I mean, I see the facility for it in a lot of different kinds of diving, but for me, it's just not really a thing I've been comfortable doing. Uh, but I've probably been spoiled with my, you know, my own bias in diving. Fair enough. So uh, dive scenarios and problem solving exercises are all part of tech courses. How can students prepare to handle themselves through these type of problems? Well, yeah, I and mean, uh, again, it starts with foundational skills because you know I'm going to have people do things like, you know, uh, you're going to take your mask off and you know go to your backup mask, which you should have in a pocket on your um, config somewhere, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, stressing people with, and, you know, you, you and your wife experience this too. It's like, okay, we're going to have some, some problem solving exercises and we're going to combine them. So, okay. You know, switching, uh, isolating a valve in a boom drill is, is great. But what happens if you're doing that when you're also st- supposed to be switching your gas or doing a buddy exercise? So the idea is to build stressors on that and have the students be prepared to understand that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, I had, uh, you know, having students get, be prepared to send up a surface marker and having them do things like, okay, you're going to send up your surface marker, but oh, gee, you're going to lose control of your surface marker and you have to switch to your backup marker. Uh, just building those kinds of stressors on people uh, helps them prepare because those are things that are going to happen. That's awesome. So here's fun. Uh, you've been an instructor for quite a while. You were my instructor. So it, it, it's an honor to, to work with you always and always teaching. And I, I learned through this as well. So based on your years experience, what are some secrets or lesser known facts that can contribute to becoming a truly exceptional dive instructor like you? <laughs> well, one of the things you know, that we, we do when we teach um, aspiring instructors is, is uh, you know, again, it's the 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 stuff about diving, when we get a, a, a dive instructor candidate, we're hoping, and I say hoping, that we're not going to teach them diving, that they're supposed to know that when they get to the point of wanting to be an instructor. We're going to teach them how to teach divers. Um, and one of the, the things I emphasize with my instructor candidates is a, a couple of simple rules. It's when you have your students, you want to figure out what they need to know and when do they need to know it. Um, we see so many instructors um, just go on and on and on and over teach uh, because many of us, we want to show our students how much we know because we are awesome. And the fact is your students don't know anything, so they already think you're awesome. Um, you know, a, a great example is I, I saw an instructor doing this, um, not one of the Stuart Scuba instructors. This was someone else I was watching elsewhere. Um, and, and they had open water students and they were going on and on and on about nitrogen narcosis, which is a, a good thing to know. But fact is, if you're teaching open water students and they're not going deeper than 60 feet, how much do you really need to talk about nitrogen narcosis? It's not really going to be much of a thing shallower than a hundred feet. Um, and they spent way too much time talking about it. 
And it was also amusing because it was clear that uh, the instructor was not a, a technical instructor who was doing this. And, and they also went into, well, they were wrong. I mean, they, they went into a, they went down the rabbit hole and kept talking and they were teaching way beyond their level of expertise. And, and I try to encourage instructors just to focus on what your students need, how they need um, to know something, and when do they need to know it. Um, and, and that goes a long way in, in making diving and teaching diving more fun for both the instructor and the students. That is huge advice right there. What do they need to know and when do they need to know it? As always, teaching me as usual. Uh, so, Paul, there's a lot of little scenarios that we all learn from other instructors or from uh, our specialties like uh, rescue and deep. Can you give us some of the off the book skills that you like to play with it during schools, during classes? Oh, sure. Um, rescue is is a class I, I love to um, to do some things like that with. Uh, you know, we we teach rescue uh, a lot. Uh, it's a really important class. But there's a lot of things that aren't really part of the standards and, and things that we like to focus on in, in rescue or, or add to the rescue class. Um, I tend to overteach on the physiology because of my, my background in, in, as an EMT. Um, and one of the things that uh, one of the other things I add to the class is, well, in addition to physiology, I have a physiology lecture, which is uh, a, a pared down version of something I did for um, public safety dive medics um, in, work here in the state of Florida. Uh, it's a, literally a day long class with something like 300 different PowerPoint slides. I have a much more pared down version of it that I do for my um, rescue students and dive master students. But, you know, some of the things I add to the class is emergency procedures on uh, if you're diving on a dive boat with someone who's diving a rebreather and they have a problem, how do you handle that? Because that's not really something that they focus on in rescue class because most people don't have that um, understanding. Or um, um, how to get someone safely to the surface if they're wearing a dry suit. One of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned to people is if you know, someone's out of gas and doesn't have uh, a, a way of inflating or adding air to their dry suit to float them on the surface, for example, how you can pop open a wrist seal, for example, take your backup regulator and kind of inflate some air through the wrist seal to inflate their dry suit a little bit to, to float them on the surface. You know, things like that, um, you know, additional skills. And, and to some degree, a lot of instructors don't elevate their own training beyond what they were taught. And, and that's what they need to do. They need to, instructors need to push their limits and push their knowledge and understanding. Um, I had a, a really amusing kind of sad experience uh, a few months ago. Uh, we were, I took a group out to Cayman Brock, awesome dive resort, awesome diving, a lot of fun. Um, and there was an instructor uh, with a group and she was also an older instructor. She was trained at about the same time I was, maybe a couple of years even before, so early 70s. And uh, my, my guys were all diving nitrox because we were doing 100-foot wall dives and such, doing at least three dives a day. Uh, but she had told her people that nitrox was a waste of time. It was voodoo gas. You didn't really need it. There were all kinds of dangers with nitrox and served no real purpose other than to put money in the hands of a dive shop. And you know, my guys and I, and we were all instructors, my, my, my group, and we were like, <laughs> so, oh my so it, and we see that occasionally where instructors who, who have not bothered to elevate their own training and expertise uh, need to do that. That is unbelievable. What are some of the fun uh, games you like to play during open water? One of mine, for example, is I, I start with a full-size Snicker candy bar at the surface and I have a mini in my pocket and I, I take them down and I express what would happen with Boyle's Law and a candy bar and I show them the little one. They're like, or the boiled egg. I, I take a raw egg at the surface and, and take a, and open up a, a, a and uh, show them a boiled egg at the, at the depth just for fun. What, what kind of fun little tricks and tips do you do with your open water that's fun? Well, you know, I, I tried doing a bunch of games and things a number of years back, and I discovered that I'm not a game kind of instructor guy. I'm a I'm going to teach you how not to die kind of instructor. Um, 
so I, I kind of have a limited number of, of games and things, of fun things, as opposed to the fun of just diving. Um, and, and part of it is because of, of our dive environment here. The, the games don't necessarily work well for me, although there's a, a caveat to that. But so if I take my open water students, for example, to Blue Heron Bridge, our dive time is limited to the tide schedule. So we have about an hour and a half of good dive time. So we have to get through our skills and get through our drills and focus on our diving. And that doesn't give us much time for some fun stuff like you know the, the 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 games things so that that's not a great environment for it and then when our we're doing our boat dives you know we're, we're drift diving so stopping to do the games uh is not a great environment to do that and we also do a lot of training out at lake denton here in florida which is a more time friendly environment it's a, a big lake it has a maximum depth of around 50 feet and unlike blue heron bridge there's no real dive window for it. So that gives us more opportunity to play some games. Um, and one of the games I love doing there is that there is both a buoyancy course and a navigation course. So their buoyancy course is a bunch of uh, PVC rings, you know, think of like hula hoops and some of them mm -hmm. are triangles and some of them are circles and some of them are rectangles and just getting people to work on getting through that buoyancy course and following me through it is, is often a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a game, um, and it's entertaining. Um, and it's, it's, a, a great way to focus on buoyancy and then putting people on a navigation course and having them shoot a, a, a bearing on their compass and finding their way again, a, a lot of fun. So these kinds of constructive games, I'm, I'm really into doing in that kind of environment. It's perfect. Excellent. Although I did have one really embarrassing thing happen during the buoyancy course a few weeks ago, we're going through a buoyancy course. And as I'm going through one of these shapes, my inflator stuck. We're only in twenty feet of water, so I banged into that into that shape pretty hard. It was really entertaining, but they did get to see how you can disconnect your inflator hose pretty quickly. Nice, nice. What's the visibility at your at your Lake Denton? Well, about what you'd expect in a lake, so you know, uh, ten feet on a, maybe a little bit more on a good day, but it's you know green, hazy, okay. murky. Uh, it's, you know, but that's also a, a good way of getting people to focus a little bit. Uh, one of the distractions of doing a Blue Heron bridge dive, for example, is there's lots of great sea life to see. So when you're trying to get someone to focus on skills and they're busy looking at a eagle ray, it's a distraction. So there's sure. far fewer distractions in Lake Denton because staring at a bunch of bluegills isn't really as much fun. Exactly. I, I can understand that uh, completely. So what's been the most rewarding experience as a mentor to young divers for you? Well, you know, I, I, and something I see a lot with instructors at my level is that, you know, they think, well, I don't teach a lot of open water classes because you know, I, I teach at a much higher level than that. And mm -hmm. I'm exactly the opposite. I love teaching open water classes because seeing people enter this world for the first time mm -hmm. and seeing them face to face with that parrotfish or turtle or seeing the shark, seeing that for the first time is just awesome. And I still love doing that. So I teach as much open water classes as, as I can. It is thoroughly entertaining, thoroughly re rewarding. And um, seeing people who started open water with me uh, and going through it to whether technical diving or even going on to being instructors is just tremendously rewarding. And that's one of the things I really love. Uh, I've had several of our students go on who are now crew members on our boats, uh, who are instructors for Stuart Scuba. And they started with me as you know somewhere along their uh, recreational diving uh, classwork. That's awesome. And I agree completely. My favorite moment where I realized that how awesome this was when I had worked with a student all the way from open water through their specialties to dive master to assistant instructor. Exactly. And I turned them loose on the surface on the open water to do the snorkeling skills. And as they were working through, I heard them talking to the students and saying things exactly the way I said it. It was like, that's my kid. <laughs> yeah. like I've, right I've, I've had to encourage some of my uh, instructor students, my instructor candidates, that they need to find their method of teaching, you know, 
come up with your own stories, your own adventures. Stop using mine. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. In fact, that's one of the last night I had a, uh, a dive master candidate give the, the last presentation. Uh, he were not a dive, I'm sorry. He's an assistant instructor candidate. Uh, give the uh, presentation for wave size and currents. And at the end of it, I talked to him, I says, what's, what uh, did you learn? And he says, he says, I need to use my own slides and, and I need to have my own stories. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, let's get you some. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's absolutely the way to go. So what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the industry? Well, just seeing how, how uh, training has evolved, whether it's from, you know, my, my start was an entire college semester to now it's, you know, a couple of hours of, of e-learning. Uh, which has made the training way more focused in many ways. Uh, and seeing how our, our standards have evolved over the uh, number of years and, and seeing how our divers have evolved, both in some good ways and, and bad ways. Uh, you know, I, I see with a younger generation of, of dive students, they're far less interested in the physics and, and the math behind diving, which is depressing in some ways, being a hardcore nerd that I am. Um, <laughs> But you know, the, you know that's what we see. Uh, you know, we also see some some from what I say perceive as you know some sad changes in the industry. I see so many uh, zero to hero programs where you know people go from open water to instructor in a, a very short window of time. Um, that's depressing. I also see that too. So many dive operations have become much more. Uh, dollar and time focused, and I understand it because there's a lot of economic pressure in the industry. But uh, you know, I, I won't certify a student at any level just because they wrote a check. Uh, you know, there needs to be uh, uh, following the standards, and and more so than following the standards, uh, they need to meet my standards uh, in order to uh, get certified. I mean, you pay for a course but you earn a certification. And I, I see people who expect that just because they paid, uh, they're going to you know, be a dive master or a tech diver or an instructor. And that's just not the way it works. That's awesome. So what advice do you have for new divers that, are, and that want to advance their careers into the diving industry? Baby steps, one step at a time. Start with your basics. Take the time to do it. Uh, you know, what I tell people, a, a lot of open water divers uh, and is when you, you know, congratulations, you've just completed your open water class. Now go diving. Now go diving, go find groups to dive with, join us on our boats, go diving, get some dive experience. And after some number of dives and you'll know when that's when you come back for that next class. That's when you come back for your, your advanced class. Uh, that's how, you know, you, you'll know when, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm not one of those guys who say, congratulations on completing your open water class here. Let's sign you up now for your advanced class. No, get the time to get comfortable, get the time to take those steps. It will make you a better diver. Um, I, I had one guy who finished his open water class, did his advanced class and was already talking about tech diving and cave diving and advanced wreck and rebreather. And I was like, okay, you, you, you've got a couple of years worth of classes to get through before you, you, you get to where you want to be. And it's great that you want to be there, but you want to get there in, in baby steps. You want to get really good at each of those steps before you take you know the next step. And fortunately he's doing that. So that's a good thing. There you go. It's certainly a balance, that's for sure. I mean, you certainly want to encourage their career and, and keep them going, keep them going, but also keep them going at a pace that's safe for them. So that's, it's certainly a balance and it's a trick. Each buddy, every progresses at their own rate, right? Exactly. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. I, as always, I appreciate you. Um, and uh, you're always my go-to when I, um, when I've got a challenge, you've, I've reached out to you of, uh, with when I'm teaching students of what you thought. You've always been fantastic about providing me that information. Well, thanks, Ben. So, I appreciate that. And I'm uh, looking forward for uh, seeing you in January. I've got some uh, tech sites that uh, I think you'll enjoy. I am very much looking forward to it. And I think there's some surprises coming down both of our, our path. But look forward to seeing you in January. Well, guys, 
Benjamin Hadfield, Teach Me to Dive with Paul. Paul's actually a contributor on Teach Me to Dive as well. You'll see his posts once in a while as well. He's fantastic. If you see an article, please read it by Paul. Paul is an amazing instructor, uh, very patient, very kind, um, extremely knowledgeable as well. And so, and one of my go-tos as well. So um, if you like this type of content, make sure you subscribe to our channel, Teach Me to Dive, and hit the, uh, the notification button because you don't want to miss a second of the oceanic goodness we have like people like Paul. Paul, thank you so much. Thank you again, Ben.